Hello everybody, James here. Story time with Dutch Mantel. Uh, the uh, it's not story time. It's asked Dutch anything, but we this is our second attempt at uh, recording a podcast because what did we just started just getting political and complaining about stuff, and then we started to, talking about personal. And stuff. you're you're going to stop that too? Why? Because I don't want to hear it. Nobody you else will liar. see it. Hey, people listen to wrestling because it takes their mind off the real stuff. You know, but we just sort so. of just we just got into a rant and then we just got into whatever and then we just started talking about everything anyway. So it, it, I'm sure it would have made a good podcast for everybody who wants to know what's really going on. But uh, you know, the, wait a minute, maybe the people won't agree with us and then they cancel us. Maybe our hundred and twelve thousand subscribers, nearly hundred and thirteen. It's, it's creeping really? up. Yeah, it's creeping up. It's creeping up. How, how close are we getting there? Oh, don't make me look. Probably by the time this comes out on Tuesday, it'll be one thirteen. Oh, that's so, good. Right, so we'll do the but very. Then very... we could we could get canceled and start going the other way. Yeah, that's what we don't want. Hey, when they when they withdraw a subscription, is that means your number goes down? Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, we don't want to do that. No, don't give people the idea to do it. Anyway, you must subscribe. Stay subscribed. Anyway, we'll do the very very quick plugs. We're on Pro Wrestling T. Several T-shirt designs. Official Dutch Mantel wear. Uh, Dutch uh, Mantel diplomas. Dutch Mantel books, all signed. You can get through Dirty Dutch Mantel with two L's at gmail.com. I have Franchise University with Shane Douglas every single Wednesday. Uh, show us the diploma Dutch very quickly. There we go. And you get two signatures with that as well. Dirty Dutch Mantel with two L's at gmail.com. They are going out like hotcakes, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you. And the most important thing, oh, five stars on iTunes if you'd be so kind. And the big thing is questions for Dutch at gmail.com if you have a question for the crafty veteran himself, Dirty Dutch Mantel, which so many of you do clearly. We're getting about 100 questions or so in every single week these days. So, you know, the vast majority won't even get picked, sadly. We try and pick the best ones out of that 100 that week, and they get put to the Dirty Dutchman in Ask Dutch Anything, which is what this podcast is. And this is what Chris C. did. He says, hey, guys, Dirty Dutch versus Harley Race with Terry Funk on commentary is worth talking about just on its own. But I want to specifically ask about Dutch's attempt to kick out around 3.40. And then he has provided a uh, time code and a link to the YouTube channel and I think we are going to watch it together so one second and we're going to do a bit of commentary on it just Dutch just say what you said just before again look at that hair <laughs> right the way out from in... so for the audio listeners this is Harley Race versus Dutch Mantel is this the only time you wrestled Harley no I wrestled him one other time this is in Memphis, but there's a, a big, long story about this. You look like a fabulous one in that jacket and that hat. Oh, I'm a handsome bastard. So, so this is Pro Wrestling USA. This is the uh, brief uh, 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 working relationship with the AWA in Memphis and Fritz von Erich's territory. I think, well, well that's it? what it was supposed to be. So... I'm watching this match. I remember this match very clearly. Mm. And I remember that they were putting a tape together for both territories. And they put me against Harley in, for whatever reason, I don't know. But they said that, and I don't want to give you the finish out of this match, but they says that they need the match to go about three or four minutes. And I went, What? Yeah, three or four minutes, and they, you know, these are people who buy tickets weekly. So I go in there and just put the guy over, and, you know, that's what you run into. I couldn't convince them otherwise. And I'm thinking, put him over in three minutes. Now, Bern Gagner's there. Is that it? Yeah, that was it. So uh, this is what uh, Chris C also said as well. So you take the stalling vertical suplex. One, two, yeah. Three, and you clearly you were... No, I could have, but... See, I had two or three territories there where they all combined their talent. Mm. But I'm thinking, wait a minute. I'm sure there's some talent in the Memphis territory that could do this same thing that I'm doing. And I'm thinking, why am I doing it? Because, you know, I, I was over in Memphis and do some sellouts, me and Lawler. And, you know, I've been on some sellouts there while I was in the main event. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, this is like, this is way down the damn, 
totem pole. And if and we didn't even have a good match, to tell you the truth. The Harley's a great worker. But we could have we we could have took that match and made it made it really good. But you can't do nothing in three minutes. You just can't do nothing. And and the part that I saw was not the part that you showed, but I was only on the offense in the first 10 or 15 seconds yeah. of it. Then it was all defense. Yeah, you got a punch just, and a headlock. I would just, and that was it. Uh, punch, headlock, headlock, punch, 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 suplex, and boom, one, two, three. <laughs> and I don't think he ever covered me any other time than the parts you showed, right? It was one cover, right? Yeah, I think so. Oh, no, he um, he hit you with the pile drive, you kicked out at two, and then he oh, covered yeah. you after oh, the yeah. suplex. Yeah. Oh, I, I was really strong. See, if you'd have went up and went to the bathroom, you'd have missed the whole match. I said, oh, has Dutch been out here yet? Uh, so I say, uh, yeah, he's. Why? It didn't go too long. What happened? Well, he got beat. What? <laughs> did it? Did it affect? See, did it affect your standing with the Memphis fans? Then, do you think after seeing that? Uh, maybe some of them. But see, I don't care. See, to me, it was professionally almost embarrassing and insulting. I mean, it's their company. They're paying me. I got it. He's the world champion. I got it. See, Jerry Jarrett was trying to tell me, well, you know, you're in there with the world champion and this, that, and the other, and uh, it still didn't. It was still three minutes. I don't give a damn who I was in there with. Hmm. So, but it is what it is, and that's some of the stuff you got to put up with within pro wrestling. Who paid you? Was it Jerry and, or was it Vern? Oh, I'm sure I was paid by still Jerry by that. Uh, but one of the things you get into is one of the damnedest businesses. Sometimes their stuff doesn't make sense. And I would argue this. I would say, why would you take one of your guys in Minnesota? Why didn't you take him out there and beat him in three minutes? But this was in Memphis. It's like the home club, Memphis, and it had a, it it didn't have a bad house, but it didn't have a good one either because they just packed everything around the bottom and just shut the bottom. But it probably had five thousand, six thousand people there, because these people didn't know a lot of those Minnesota guys, and and this tape was uh, going to Texas. It was going all over. So if it's the first time people had had seen me on TV, well, hell, they, they see me getting the crap beat out of me, so I don't mean anything. So, but it is what it is, and I've left that a long time ago. Still doesn't make sense to me today. So, Next question. Jim says, I only subscribed about a month ago, so maybe you've already talked about this, which, but I don't think we have for this question. But I was wondering at what point in your life you realized or were told that wrestling matches were predetermined works. <laughs> I once... They are? Oh, go ahead. I wasn't go sure ahead. I was going to say Harley Race beat you in three minutes. Was uh, that was no, that a work? No. Oh, it was a work. <laughs> oh, I think Harley told me, kick out right on three. Like that's going to mean something. Okay, Harley, I'll do it. Uh, so uh, Jim says, I once asked my dad if he knew when he was watching wrestling with me, and he was like, yeah, of course I did, but I wasn't going to spoil the fun for you. Be interested to know what your experience was. Is he asking me or asking you? Oh, no, he's asking you. Oh. Hey, listen, I, I watched wrestling. I guess I was seven or eight years old, and I watched it with with my mother. She was the wrestling fan in the family, and she'd get all excited, and and somebody would come in, oh, that's all fake. She didn't want to hear that. And I never told her that because I didn't want to get slapped around a little bit. <laughs> would you talk? I enjoy this. And we would watch it at like 11 o'clock on Saturday night, and it was from, and the people who are from this area, they know what I'm talking about maybe not the wrestling show, but it was a WLOS, uh, 
Asheville, North Carolina. I think that was Channel 13. And it would come on, and it was, it'd be a tape from like Raleigh or, or somewhere. And my old cohort at Smoky Mountain, Bob Caudill, was the announcer. And I had no idea that go forward, I would be co-hosting a show in Smoky Mountain Wrestling, me and Bob Caudill. So, but I could see it even when I was uh, even a kid, you know, something wouldn't look right or this, that, or the other. And of course, I never said nothing about it, but I never had any desire to actually get in, get into pro wrestling. I didn't have a burning desire to say, oh, I'll, I'll get in there and I'll do this and I'll do that. I didn't care. But what got me into it was my oldest brother. Uh, he really, he wanted to be the wrestler, not me. So finally he had some friends. <laughs> they all went. One of them was a, a welder. <laughs> so they figured out how to get this ring built. And they built the ring and then got to, to had to know how to put the, the supports across there, the metal supports. Then the plywood put it down. Then, then they found out how to get a mat. So they got a ring. And then I, that's the first time I ever stepped in a ring. And, and I, I trained. I didn't really train because there was nobody there to train me. I mean, we all knew about what the other one knew. And the first match I ever had, I wrestled in. And I was under the mask, and I forgot what I called myself, something. But, and it was about like 50 people there. Mm. <laughs> but we went, went out and we worked our butts off, and we got some of them into the match. But, but that's how I got into wrestling business. So... But he he was the one who wanted to be the big the big star, but he couldn't because he had a wife and they had like three or four kids, so he couldn't hit the road and try to be a big star. Had been, been the worst thing he could have done. So we'll, we'll say um, we'll say the older brother's called Butch Mantel. Oh, I had several names. It's, it's, I had uh, it's gonna have to it's gonna have to rhyme with yours. Butchy Butch, but Butch doesn't rhyme with Dutch. Butch, Butch Wood. Botch. Botch is a good good one. <laughs> Botch Mantel. Botch Mantel. <laughs> he botches everything. <laughs> he can't get a hip toss right. So we'll uh we'll move on. Uh Rob and that's what bothers me. That's what bothers me about that uh the training school they have down here in Orlando. Mm -hmm. Those guys don't even know how to when's the last time you saw a bill? You know what a bill is? Yeah, hip toss out the corner. Yeah, I remember you've uh, we've we I think we talked, talked about, about this. Quite, yeah, we've talked and about it, this. It, but it irritates the crap out of me. You know, guy said I'm gonna get really high on it. No, you're not, because you can only get so high when they put their hands right here. You go up, then it hurts like hell when they're trying to push you. Put your arm back there, and now the guy's moving anyway. Push him. That's how you get the distance and the height. I used to be a uh, gypsy uh, Joe out of the corner. Sometimes it looked like he was going to leave the ring. He would just fly over there. Made it look so easy. Anyway, that's that's the one move they do wrong. Mm. They do a few more, too. Arm drags is one of them. I hope somebody over there in at the training center, performance center, sees this and brings it to to their attention. Mm. You know what they'd say? Ah, oh, that Dutch thinks he knows everything. Look what he's doing now. Tell you the truth. Will this famous is more, podcaster. Yeah, this, this is better <laughs> than making. Actually, I've had some weeks doing this that, you know, match some of my weeks in WWE. Believe me. Because WWE, sometimes they don't pay that well. They want you to believe they pay that well. But some guy saying, eh, nah, I don't think. Thanks to Vince. Hey, 
I got to I got to talkies today. Weren't we going to talk about Stephanie McMahon sometime? We are saving that for story time next week or this week on Friday. All right. Because you told me, I'll put it in the notes. We'll be talking about it on Friday, I promise you. Uh, we're going to get to the next question. Robert, hey Dutch, I'm a big fan and admirer and I enjoy the podcast. You guys keep things interesting and fun. Kudos, thank you. I was trained by thank Chris you. Adams and worked I on his road I won't hold. I won't hold that against you. No, absolutely. Uh, where was I? Worked on his road shows for 94 to 96. I have some crazy stories of my own from that time, but one stands out from the rest. Chris used a crew of roadie types to handle the ring and provide security for events, all veterans of the business. One of the crew told me stories concerning Brody's death, Bruiser Brody's death, that I've never heard since. She said that the Puerto Rico crew was upset over Brody. She said. She said. No, she she's said. a road. She's a ring crew, and she's a she. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's also a song okay. by Long Pigs as well. Uh, Bruiser Brody's refusal to lose to Dan Spivey, who was champion at the time, so it would allow Carlos Colon an opportunity to challenge for the belt, to win, and the territory's hero again. So this fella is saying that he heard that Bruiser Brody stabbing was over, not jobbing to Dan Spivey, who I've already researched was not the champion at the time. No, that that is not true. That is nowhere even close to the truth. I think who who was uh, Brody supposed to work with that night? Dan Spivey. Dan I, Spivey. Actually, I actually saw the card. I actually looked up the card, and he was meant to wrestle Dan Spivey. I don't think that match even. Well, I know it did happen, but I don't know who Spivey actually worked with that night. I don't remember, but and I wouldn't remember anyway if somebody told me because you know the. There's pandemonium in that dressing room. Uh, no, it wasn't over Brody refusing to do it. They had an understanding with Brody. They didn't bring him in just to beat him. They brought him in to, you know, for the big shows. And he'd always do about the same thing. It'd be a, it'd, it'd be a double count out and they'd fight through the crowd and all this. It was about the same all the time. But... He didn't refuse to put anybody over because, no, that's that's totally inaccurate. No. It really was. We'll, um, we'll stick with and, Dan. I'm sorry. Go ahead. We'll stick with Dan Spivey. Well, I was going to stick with Dan Spivey. We've talked a lot about Bruiser Brody. We did a special uh, on his passing. I think maybe it was his 35th anniversary uh, that we did that for. So go hunt that out in the archives, a full episode. But let's stick with Dan Spivey. I hadn't realized he'd been in Puerto Rico. He only went a few times, but have you any stories of Dan at that point? Well, he didn't much like it, to tell you the truth. If you go to Puerto Rico, you know, it's uh, it's got its good parts. It's like every place else. It has its really bad parts. And you better find out where the bad parts are so you don't accidentally stray into them after dark because you probably get shot the drug trade there is is gigantic because it's on a port and they can bring those drugs in and they just go down to the shipyard and and pull it right off of course that's a lot of people on the ship getting money too and but you go into the bad part of town you're in trouble even if you speak spanish or not because if you, you and, you know, Brody was a white guy, so they think he he would be maybe police, surveillance, or something. And if people tell him no or not, they wouldn't believe him, and he, he could get shot. Uh, so, yeah, bro, it, but Spivey didn't go much. I think he called up maybe, or maybe Carlos called him. I don't know. But I only remember him being down there maybe twice during that period. And then after the Brody, I mean, it became a virtual virtual ghost town for American talent. Then the American talent boycotted it, and they wouldn't, they wouldn't go there. And I did go back, but about six years later, because by that time, and the only reason I went, people said, why'd you go back there? Because there was nowhere else to work. Because by that time, the WWF and Vince, now he's done a lot of damage to the existing wrestling business. He took it over and then left it to die 
the performers to leave to he left them to starve to death. But uh, I forgot what I was going to mm. say now. Well, I'll uh, tell you what, I'll add on to that slightly. Uh, uh, Dan Spivey only turned up maybe a couple of times. He didn't actually yep. wrestle, as far as I can tell, on that card, maybe when Bruiser was stabbed, so maybe they just kept him off. He did tag up with Abdullah the Butcher versus Brody and Carlos Colon um, in probably a week before the Brody murder, and then he actually went back a couple of months after the Brody murder and wrestled and lost to Wahoo McDaniel. Uh, any other stories about Dan Spivey that we uh, that's worth telling? Well, I like Dan. He played football at the University of Georgia, which was kind of in my neck of the woods. I was only from the from the campus in Athens. I was only like 60 miles away. So Georgia football was big as Clemson for football fans. Clemson was about 15 miles away. So when they played, they hadn't played. Boy, they, they started back playing here recently. But they were just – they were bangers. They were a hell of a games, great games. But uh, – he was a quiet guy and smart guy, but you knew right away that if you got out of line with Spivey, he was a, a a big guy too. He was about six six, about two sixty maybe. So, and he was not very talkative. I mean, he talked to you, but you know, he's not like he's not like you, James. He wouldn't want to monopolize the whole conversation like you do, but and you knew if you messed around with him, somebody was going to get somebody was going to get jacked up. But and he was laid back and quiet. So what that was saying, you got to watch the quiet ones. You'd have to watch this guy. But he was a really, really, really good guy. We'll move on. Rob Burmy, another Rob in fact. Hi, James and Dutch. Question. When the WWE or any other promotions have a championship contract signing in the centre of the ring, my question is this. What documents are actually being signed? Is it a legitimate contract or just a load of nonsense typed out to resemble an official contract? That's a joke, right? No, someone this actually is, this, someone did this write This is a jo- This is a joke question. Who wrote it? What's uh, the guy's name? Uh, Rob from Birmingham, UK. I, I think it's pretty easy to say that, no, they're just fake contracts. Yeah, it may have something there like so and so agrees to step in. They have probably had not a real contract, but it just states where it is, what building it's in, what time, under what promotion, on who's wrestling who, what type of match, and and just two places for you to sign. Yeah, it could be real, but it's not official. I mean, if a fan picked it up, they could read that, so it looks official. Yeah, it's more it's it's for show, like anything else. It'll be the, so, first, the first page will look official enough, but they have like a giant logo on it. So the thing is, I wanted to ask this because you know some fans might be newer fans and might not know it. I mean, I mean, we we take for granted because we sort of think we know everything or a lot of things within, but other people uh, other people may not. So it's nice we, to get them out. You do know everything, don't you? Most things. I, I don't know two things. <laughs> yeah, but it's no, it, it's not official. It is. It could be a, a real contract. They could do that. But that's for if anybody like wanted to be nosy, and it got left behind, mm. or, yeah, or, or it gets it right in the camera. You know, the camera gets a good shot of the front. At least the first page has got to look official enough, I guess. It does. Yeah. It has to look like it. Is the real deal. We're going to move on. Todd from Columbus, Ohio, USA. Hello, Dutch and James. Hope all is well in your neck of the woods. I'm becoming a big fan of your content and hope you sustain your recent momentum. Thank you very much. Excuse me, I had a massive burp going there. My question <laughs> is actually for James, since no one ever gets to ask him questions. Oh, okay, it's for me, apparently. Other than the wrestlers you maintain regular podcasts with, Dutch RVD, which I don't have a podcast with, and Shane Douglas, who has been your favourite wrestling personality to interview and why? Why? Okay, who do you think my favorite's been? I mean, you must know some of the guys I've interviewed. Oh, that's a good answer. What do you say? No, I, what do you mean? <laughs> oh, you're asking me? Yeah, I'm asking you. Who do you think it would be? 
that you know I spoke to. Okay, who have you interviewed? Uh, like a hundred people of all the guests that we've had. Give, give me, give me the top. Give me oh, uh, mine of the ones we've had on Story Time. Who do you think? Well, I tell you what, Kenny Bolin was too much. He really was. He talks and talks and talks. You got to shut him up. One not too long ago was Jamie Dundee. Mm -hmm. He was too much, and Ricky Morton was good. I thought. Really good. I like JBL. I thought JBL was great. JBL was good, except you could tell he didn't want to say anything bad about anybody. Yeah. Because usually if you ride with him in the car, oh, <laughs> he just rips them a new butthole. Oh, my God. I said, would you tell them if they were, hey, he said, hell yeah. I'd tell them if they said something about it, I'd just yank them out and just beat the crap out of them right here on the side of the road. And riding with JBL is entertaining as hell. I should have bought a ticket. It's like buying a ticket to a, a comedy show because he's funny as hell. He 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 really is. Got some great, great stories. So, I, I mean, I I can't pull a story off the top of my head, but he is he's too much. I'll I'll give I'll give I'll give. Uh, I hate to you say know who I like answer. to go on. You know who I like to have on here. Go on. Ron Simmons. Hmm. Do you think we could get him? I don't know. I'll call him up because he owes me a favor anyway. Why? What did, did you save him? No, not, no, no. I, I can't tell what I did for him. I'll tell you off air. Oh, okay. Well, that's interesting. You got to you got to promise never to tell. I promise nothing. Um, the <laughs> the uh, I promise I will never tell. <laughs> Okay. Uh, uh, to answer your question, Todd, um, if I'm going to be a complete mercenary, I'd say the person who I enjoyed the most was the person who brought in the most views, which would be Eric Bischoff, which sounds a really terrible thing, but I, I actually did enjoy talking to Eric as well. I enjoy talking to most people. I didn't enjoy talking to the fucking Sandman, though. He was awful. He was all right for the first 15 minutes, and then he decided he hated me and then just gave me like the worst interview in the world. Uh, so I'll never have him on again. Why did he do, why did he do that? I don't know. It, I don't know what he, what was up with him. He just I don't know if it was a bad day or what, but yeah. Was he drinking? It was 9 a.m., so probably. Um, uh, I'm trying to think. I, I stay in contact with quite a few people who have interviewed, so I, I don't want to embarrass too many people. I, I'm trying to think who I really enjoyed or like really got on. I remember really getting on with Blue Meanie, Stevie Richards, Johnny Candido, uh, Mikey Whitrack, Whitrack, who I just interviewed that will be on soon. I really got on with him. I got on with loads of people. Mm -hmm. um, it's tough to narrow it down, but to be honest, quite a lot of them. As far as like people who really surprised me, Greg Valentine you know who was I would hilarious. Like, yeah, you know who I'd like to see you interview? Bill Clinton. <laughs> no, Hillary probably is better than you. <laughs> uh, Tony Khan. God, you see, I couldn't, I couldn't, I just, I just give him grief. Why you couldn't say anything good? Yeah, you've got very nice hair. You couldn't say anything about AEW? Yeah, I'd say it's really, really dimly lit. It is dimly lit. Yeah. But, uh, but I don't know why, since you brought that up, I think the announcing is okay. Camera shots, okay. But you can't see half of it. Well, no, it's, you know, it's just it's dimly lit. Well, that... You know how much money WWE pays for lighting? Oh, a million. You you said like sixty grand or something. We talked See, about this that, recently. That was years years ago when they just had the middle deal. Now I bet they pay half a million dollars. Oh, probably easily. Uh, we uh, we discussed this recently, so we shall move on. And we're gonna. I go would just to... give everybody a flashlight. They would just have it on the phone. Have the torch on the phone going, and then it'd be like the uh, Bray Wyatt thing. So at least it'd be interesting. Right, that would be. We're uh, we're moving on. Craig Tamworth. I believe in the early days there were negotiations to get Vader into TNA. Why did it not happen? And another point is apparently Vader left uh, Japan's pro wrestling Noah promotion around this time under mysterious circumstances, but he claimed it was a knee injury. So, do you remember ever trying to negotiate with Vader trying to get into TNA? I heard about it, but when you hear something, when I was in TNA, when you hear something, it would do this. <laughs> In one ear, 
and out the other one. I put very little substance into what I would hear when I was with when I was in TNA. It may happen and it may not. So why even think about something if there's if it hasn't happened? I'll start thinking about it when it when I know for sure whether the guy's coming or not. But they I think Vader's asking price was a little too much for them because I think Sting's asking price was like this was half a million a year. So half a million a show. No, no, no. It would have been half a million a year. No. Sting. Half a million no. a show. No, not a show. It was half Oh, it, it was seven hundred thousand. Was what it was a, a year. That's what it was. Mm. And uh, Kurt Angle got there, and I think he was trying to make as much money as Sting, or more money. I think he did. I think he was in a million a year or something, maybe. Uh, he, uh, but he did come in there over Sting, and I'm thinking, you know. To get a job, now think about this. You in real life, you got a job somewhere. You're a friggin' welder for a construction company. And you might be making $50 an hour or more. That sounds great. Yeah, good wage. Do you think about, here's this guy coming in who's ready to retire, and this was 10 years ago or more, or more, it's like 15 years ago, and he's making $700,000 a year? How much is that a week? 15000 Yeah, something like that, I think, yeah. $15,000 a week, and sometimes he's not even on TV. He just shows up and goes to catering and sits around. Well, that's... You, you, it makes that little welder's job like, what the hell am I doing? It's a nice work but, if you can get it. Uh, very, yeah, it is. Very, it is. I know Vader came in like once in 2003 before you know he why, arrived. You, but you know why Sting got that money? And he was a big star. I'm not saying that. Because he asked for it, I guess. Because Dixie was a fan. And, you know, she, she wanted to pay him all this and... You know, she she wanted to compete with WWE because her father is worth about a billion dollars. The uh, her dad, and he's a good guy, but I doubt if he wanted to spend most of his fortune on a on a on a wrestling promotion that had very little chance of succeeding. You know, TNA could have done better had they really participated in knowing how to promote. Mm. They would go to a town and they would have no ads on TV, no ads in the paper, or maybe one little one, and no radio ads. And we'd go in there, some of these actually pretty big-sized towns, and you'd draw like 300 people. 400 people. I'm going to send you a video. We were in some town in, I think, Idaho. And you think, Idaho, who lives in Idaho? But they had this arena that seated 10,000. So they must have interest in something enough to draw 10,000 people. You know, you got concerts coming through there. But you could sit back, and I'm going to show you this picture. If I can find it, I saw it the other day. But you could literally sit back and count the people in the stands. And it was, I don't know, I don't, they depended on whatever channel they were on. What channel were they on? Uh, was it Spike? Start, you, it was well, Spike. Well, it, well, originally when they were on, they were on like HD Net or something like that, or like some Fox affiliate, and then I think they went to but, Spike. But we put, it was on Spike, and some of the ratings on Spike was okay. I mean, it wasn't, some of it was embarrassing, 
I remember our first show on Spike, it drew like 250,000 people. Oh, my God. Dixie called a meeting. And it was like the Pope had been killed or something. It was like, we got to do better than this. We got to do better. It was our first show. And you got to you got to advertise it. That's what advertising is. That's why I was invented to tell people that they can get, they can see wrestling or they can see a, a show or they can see a race or they can see a football game. You got to tell them where it is and how to get tickets. But they thought that that TV station was going to take care of all that for them. It didn't work. Now, the next week it went up. We got it up one time to almost two million. But guess what we got out of it? We didn't even get a thank you. It was they just went on like, well, it should be better than this. I'm thinking, well, I know you're paying me, but not that much. You know, a thank you would be like welcome. And you know what got it to, I don't know if it was two million, but it was well, it was like one point. 700,000, 1 million, 700, or something like that. But guess what got it up there? Awesome Kong. Awesome Kong and Gail Kim. Mm -hmm. We put them in a main event and they went the last 30 minutes of the show and they spiked it up there. Then here's the rest of the story. You know, I'm like Paul Harvey. Now here's the rest of the story. Gail Kim. And Awesome Kong had the audacity, listen, to go in and ask Dixie for a raise. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I think, it, I think it pissed her off. And she didn't give them a raise, so they said, well, we got to go. Yeah, I had built the whole thing around Kong, the whole thing. And I told her, I said, I want you to be Abdullah the Butcher of the Girls. And she went out there and beat the crap out of them. And she was over. Do, do you know any other ways that TNA or Dixie Carter would just throw money away? Because obviously they didn't advertise properly. Uh, you know, not about like the quality of the shows or, you know, they didn't advertise the pay-per-views or they didn't. I know there was some exceptions, like basically what you booked, Awesome Kong and Gail Kim, Kurt Angle and Samoa Joe, those things. But weirdly, when you booked it, Pay-per-views and viewership went up. <clears throat> but uh, were there any other creative ways that Dixie Carter would waste money? Well, if I thought about it long enough, I tried not to think about her any more than I had to. I, I kind of like Dixie, but you couldn't tell her. She thought she knew the wrestling business. So it wasn't my place to go in there and say, this is the way it really is, Dixie. What I wanted to tell her is these guys know you got money. They know that. They can smell it. I said, I smelled it too, but till you put a clothespin on my nose so I couldn't tell it anymore, so I worked for peanuts. So so <laughs> they go in there, and, and she would go online, I guess, and go to YouTube or wherever, and she'd think this guy's a big star. And pay him what he was asking for. Of course, you ask for more money than you think you're going, than you're going to get. Hell, she'd give them more money. So they loved her. So when you ask them to do something, oh no, no, no. And some guys there that had worked in the WWF, WWE, when you gave them a finish, they ran it through two lenses. Because they had plans to go back to WWE. So they didn't want to do nothing in a subpar promotion. And TNA was second or third. Let's say second doesn't exist. It was third without even somebody being second. It was third to WWF. And they wouldn't do anything that would make them like do it. They wouldn't get beat. Because you know who was watching that show? Vince. Vince. And if they call Vince back and want their job, he'd say, 
well, pal, I saw you with so-and-so farmer, John, or whatever, and he beat you in about 10 minutes. What do you expect me? So they would look at it through two lenses, and I don't know. It was it was very difficult <clears throat> to uh, to survive there, to work there. So I just got out of the habit of trying to explain this. I'm not saying I'm even explaining it in the right way. I'm just saying I wouldn't go over there and say that. I just kind of went back into my shell and stayed in catering. Right, we're going to move. That's how, that's how I know their foods are craps. Yeah. We get a lot of people saying your career in catering and stuff like that now. I think the catering thing is becoming a meme but, within the show. No, uh, they, they started. I said that first, <laughs> and then they all they, – they they're thieves. Them. They're comedy thieves is what they are. Right, we're going to move on. Do, we, I got, was the heavyweight champion of catering. I was that. I'm just having a look how many questions. Oh, God, we got loads, right? We're going to get through as many questions as we can, I promise you. Dirk Dewitt. Dutch, first, I really dig the We The People gimmick. My question is why haven't you gone to AEW with Jake Hager? If there was any time in history, this is it. The country is practically a civil war. No kidding. Probably one reason that <clears throat> I don't go to AEW is because... We haven't been very kind to Tony on this show. We, we haven't been very kind to AEW on the show. We've been truthful. Yeah, but truthful. But see, that's not called being kind. You know, being kind is, yeah, they're going to get better or, you know. And we hadn't actually been kind to Tony. We've said that he needs a booker. He needs somebody who knows how to weave a story together. And you know what surprises me about AEW is they don't do hardly anything they do, but not much, outside the studio. You know, WWE used to go on the road and tell these little stories within the stories. You remember when apparently uh, Steve Austin shot Austin? Pillman. Pillman Who'd shot. Who'd he shoot? Pillman shot Austin. Pillman, Yeah. And the people, they were so wrapped up in that story, they believed it. Well, USA nearly threw them off for that. And you remember the limousine blowing up? Yep. And everybody believed that. Why did Because, it? yes, you did. What you did sit it? Over, Come you're on, sitting mate. there over in England thinking Harvard educated is probably the best in the world. What? No, Eton. Is, what's the big college over there? Well, Eaton's a not a college university. Uh, Cambridge, Cam Cambridge. Oxford, yeah. You can have one of them. Yeah, yeah, that that. But I didn't go to either of them. No, I didn't. Yes, really but but it looked real, didn't it? Oh, it was well shot, definitely, and it was very interesting. Then Chris but Benoit ruined Forrest, it. But but tell me something. But for a second, you went, no, they didn't. Yes or no? No. For us, no, for a, a second. Story like, no, not for a second. I knew it was story oh. line the entire way. See what you have done. You have really prohibited yourself from being from getting caught up in the story. Yeah, you didn't think it was a great angle. That's that's not what you asked. You asked if I thought if it really happened. Well, you, you heard the question I just asked. Just say yes. Uh, yeah, it was great. Yeah, it it was excellent. But as I said, Chris Benoit then ruined it, and we never got closure on that. Why did Chris Benoit ruin it? He, because killed, he the, killed his family and then killed, himself, and then they just had to get rid of the storyline immediately. So we never actually found out where it went. Well, I see. So, well, anyway, but he does. Um, let me get back to t Tony. Tony Khan. He shoots very little out of the studio, and if he have a writer to write that stuff, they could go do that the day before, the day of. And weave it together so it makes sense. Shoot some of it after dark, like somebody's coming to the arena. Some guy's had him arrested. He's barely got time to make it and show him pull up in the parking lot and run in. He don't even have his wrestling stuff on, maybe one boot on. And they have a match. Now, people would kind of get with that, I think. I mean, that's just the way somebody is dressed. But the story could be anything. Now, as long as you, as long as it's interesting, 
because you said the story can be anything, this actually goes to the next question that is also about Jack Swagger, Jake Hager. Actually, it's from Todd from oh. Columbus, Ohio again. And he asks, uh, I'm sure you can agree that uh, Jack Swagger, Jake Hager, has been severely mismanaged in AEW. He had some pretty good momentum going the first six months after he arrived there, being Jericho's heavy in his faction, but is now relegated to being some goof that likes a bucket hat tagging with marginal talent. In your eyes, what would be the quickest way to resurrect the great career of this former heavyweight champion outside of him coming back to WWE? So, uh, I think we both agree. Uh, he's been on the show before, Jake Hager, and he's not being used to the best of his ability. I mean, if you were booking him, you know, aside from just giving him the, the top championship, what do you think the best thing for Jake Hager is now as far as uh, bringing him back up to where he should be? Best thing he can do right now? Yeah. You get a job. <laughs> quit to quit the <to> promotion. <laughs> <laughs> short short of quitting the promotion, what do you think yeah. creatively he would be best? No, at? there's a lot of. Well, I'd have to go in there and study. I don't even know who their who their top guy is. They got everybody's hurt, right? Yeah, it, Samoa Joe is basically the top guy now. Well, Samoa Joe and Hager, I don't see anything that's right off the bat. There's you got to look at chemistry. And you got to go on in. You got to take your time with Jack. And say I went in there with him, which I wouldn't do because I'm, I'm not in condition enough to even get in the ring anymore. So, but if you brought him back, and I think we the people, a political, a political uh, gimmick would work, big time work. <clears throat> Because these cable channels are going 24-7. There's an election coming up. There's this coming up. Ukraine's coming, you know, getting money. Russia's acting up. China. We got people coming across the border. I mean, the country has a, uh, a, a surplus of things happening to it that are not good. Is, is, is Jake politically minded? In that sense, he is think? to a he is to a degree, but it doesn't matter his political mindedness if he has somebody talking for him, and they're pushing him to that degree. I guess if you sit down and talk to him, you know he may be up to date on it, and he may not. See, people, when I was doing We the People and I was Zeb Culture, they believed that because. They had no reason to disbelieve it, really, because every time I went out there, and I do remember a time they had Titus, and who was his little tag along? Um, young, not young. Darren Young? Darren Young. They wanted me to go out there and say something very racist. And I said, guys, I know you want to paint me as a militant, and uh, I don't agree with everything, but I says, I don't know where painting me out to be a racist would help anything. And they said, well, say it anyway, say it anyway. And if you know, we don't like it, we'll take it out. Well, I went out there and I said it, but not the way they wanted me to say it. And guess what the crowd did? And all the energy went out of them. Mm. I wanted to tell them they're hearing this stuff 24-7. They damn sure don't want to hear it, that that topic on a wrestling show. So so they, they uh, and Triple H told me that. And to their to their credit, they did take it out. But but I remember the first time and they told me I was gonna be the most hated man in the in the company. Hell, I was like halfway down the list of the ones they liked the most because I was speaking truth to the, to the power, I guess, because a lot of people I would talk about, like, you know, the immigration and this, that, and the other, and, you know, they actually, and gas prices and all this, that was things they could relate to. They could go out on the street and see what I was talking about. So they couldn't disagree with me. And a lot of them did agree with me when I would say, I want every real American in this building or within the sound of my voice to please rise, put your hand over your heart 
say along with me, we, the people. Well, about at least half of them would get up and say it. I'm thinking, well, the other half, and even part of the other half would get up because they just wanted to get up and do something. Hmm. I even went to Manchester, England. I told you that story, right? Mm -hmm. Hell, half of them got up there, and, <laughs> but I changed it. You know, I say I saved the to the end, like God saved the queen. Oh, they went nuts. They loved that. So, but it was a, and it was something that Vince wanted. They wanted to do something with Jack. They needed somebody who could talk. And they had tried, uh, I think, uh, Jimmy, what was his name? Jim Mitchell, he tried, apparently. Not not Jim, I, I, not well, Jim Mitchell. Uh, Jim, Jimmy Golden. Jimmy Golden, they tried him. I think they tried Robert Fuller. But Robert is too much of a damn, like a carnival barker to take him seriously. And so when they got me up there, they said, okay, go with it. And I, I ran it for two years. Uh, uh, one more idea is, so you remember last year that uh, Jake Hager and Claudio Castagnoli faced off in the ring and the entire crowd started chanting, we the people. So, we the people. So, I mean, it's basically the most, uh, definitely in, in, in Jake's, you know, it's, it's the character that's most associated with him. Do you think teaming up with, teaming up with Cesaro again might be a good idea or is that just a regression at this point? I think it's a regression. But now for teaming up with him again, that would require some major, not restructuring a booking, but a mindset. You're going to go with this or you're just going to put them together. You got to remind them every time they go on TV and these announcers, I got to quit talking about bullshit in the earlier match. They got to talk, uh, I mean, current politics. That's the only way it would work. So when he teamed up with us when I was in, in WWE, and they were getting over. That's when we got to, we, we had a match on TV against the Usos, and we was going to beat them or somebody. And then they changed, I told you this, yeah. they changed the finish right in the middle of the match, mm -hmm. but didn't even tell me till I saw it. And I looked up there and I said, what the F? Did you guys do? And they said, well, they, Vince said, change it. And you know what I said? Okay, okay let's go. Let's go. And nothing else to say. It's his company. He can say what he wants to say. He's the boss. And when I went to the back, I didn't say one word to Vince. I didn't even say, uh, I didn't even say, I wish you'd told me at the beginning. Because if they told me at the beginning, they wouldn't have a, they, they wouldn't have a need to, radio was halfway through the match through the referee to tell us change finish. But in, in response to that, they were actually good enough pros to really change the finish and made it look good. Next question. Stephen Mackey asks, I don't know if you've got an answer for this actually, but I'll ask it anyway. Hi Dutch. Were you aware of an issue that John Cena had with Alex Riley when you were in WWE? The dirt sheets reported at the time that Alex Riley lost his push because he reacted badly to a rib Cena pulled on him around 2012. I thought that Alex Riley had the it factor and was a future world champion. He was over after turning babyface on the Miz, but it seemed that after the storyline WWE didn't know what to do with him. And apparently Alex in a later interview has basically confirmed that an interaction with Cena sort of saw the end of his uh, career on top. Do you remember anything about the Cena Alex Riley thing? What year, what year was this? Twenty twelve. This was Alex Riley was in the company another year while you were there, so you shared a small time crossover at that point. I heard about it. I think he remember earlier. I was talking that it doesn't take a lot to lose your push, not with Vince. Not with him in charge. It could be anything. So Cena probably didn't like Alex Wright was his name. Riley. Alex Riley. So he probably just went and poured his heart out to Vince. Well, we can fix that. They just didn't didn't tell Riley nothing and just stopped pushing him. And probably I don't know if it's true. I, I, Alex Riley will never know if it's true or not. But his his uh, thesis on it, or his final thought on it, 
It's probably true because I've seen it done, and I think it was done in this case. Do you know of any other Cena power plays around this time? Because I think Jake Hager has said similar. I think uh, Wade Barrett had said similar about Cena, that he would uh, do the odd power play to make himself strong at the oh, expense yeah, he of did. talent. Do you know anyone specifically? I don't, I don't know anybody specifically, but I, you know, if he didn't want to work on TV against whoever, he would he would complain and moan. See, he was he was concerned with one thing, and I don't blame him here. This is not a a knock on John, but if he thinks, you know, what we showed earlier, Harley Race beat me in three minutes. Well, I brought it up, and guess what was done about it? Zero. But John Cena would just flat out tell him, I'm not doing it. I am not doing it. So I could have done that too, but I could have probably been out of a job the next week. Uh, but if Cena didn't want to do it or if he didn't like how – I've seen him – see, the writers would come up with, like, to finish how they wanted it to end. And they wouldn't come up with the exact uh, like mode or method they want to use. But they say, he makes this big comeback and all of a sudden do this and this and this. And then we need something to stop him or slow down. And that's when the talent comes in. And talent said, oh, well, he can throw a drop kick. I could get out of the way. That's good. That's good. And you work it out. But if, if they worked it out before Cena – got on the scene. Well, he's going to change it all. He didn't like this. He didn't like that. And But in defense of John, he knew he was going to draw money, so he didn't want anything to make him look bad. And if, if you could beat him down enough to leave him laying, that means he respected you and he saw money with you. Say The Rock could just beat him up and leave him laying. Well, he could do that because Rock's a top guy. Or Roman Reigns is the top guy. But anybody else? No. We need to he'd say, I think we need to rethink that. <laughs> I know I know I know there's no names that are coming to you specifically, but that's something you've seen Cena personally do. Say, so nope, not happening or change it. Have I seen him do that? Yeah. No, I've never seen him do it. Because this is all behind see behind that dressing room door is secrecy. Unless the guy that was in the meeting tells you himself, and he will tell very few people if he tells anybody at all. And it starts with, say, John pulling the rider. And he's, I think he had the same rider as Rock did, Gerwitz. They could pull him back there, and it's their business to straighten it out. And it's Gerwitz's business to keep it running smoothly. So he's trying to smoothed out the edges, but unless they tell you something happens, you have no idea. How does it, fil- how does it filter out then to you guys? Is it just, what now? How does it filter down to the locker room then? Is it just, you know, like it happens to somebody in the locker room, someone complains and then it spreads from there. How do we know? Yeah. Oh, it hit a, hit a leak somewhere. It may not leak that night, but it hit a leak within the next week or so. But who's going to go up and say, John, did you do this? Nobody's going to do that. So what it is, the rumor, and I may be getting the the rumor, the exaggerated rumor, the rumor grows on its own because nobody has ever actually went to the source, say Gerwitz or or Cena, and ask him. I know that you, I know you never talked about it with Jake, but you should ask him one day because he said on interviews before that he wasn't ever seen as biggest fan. We're going to ask a couple more, then we're going to shut down this podcast. Jalen Maldonado. Why wasn't, why wasn't he seen as biggest fan? I believe say? I believe it's another Cena creative power play. That, no, it is a power play, and he's you know he's he's going he was going to Hollywood. He's going to do this. He was going to do that. I listen. I don't blame him. I really don't, because he probably made, he had some six or seven or eight, $10 million years there. Mm. So it don't take that many years to to really get you straight. So 
Next question, Jalen Maldonado. Hello, Dutch. I was wondering when was your last interaction with the Dead Man? Do you still keep in touch? And if you could, would you want to have the Undertaker on the podcast like JBL? Well, I doubt if I could get Undertaker on the podcast because I think his podcast appearances are a bit pricey. Has to be approved, I think. And he may want money. I doubt if he wants money. I mean, hell, he's got fifty million dollars in savings anyway. What's he need like five hundred bucks? He's not gonna do that. <laughs> but I, I think it's according to how he's gonna be portrayed. And has he, he's done a, he's done a podcast with Rogan, right? Yeah. It's, so it's a couple he, of levels above ours. Yeah. I'm saying, hmm. and he, he did it with Joe Rogan. So when you get in that stratosphere, that's a, a pretty big, it's several notches above us. Not much, oh. but. About just a $90 million dollar dollars above us that's it yeah. big big deal <laughs> and do i stay in contact with him i do not stay in contact with him because he's in austin texas and i'm in i'm in florida and i used to be up to three or four years ago i used to be based out of uh, nashville and uh but i did see him walking into perth australia on a little tape I saw was all the talent walking into the building. Okay. Did you see that? No, I've not seen that. Undertaker was like the head of the line. He was just a line of guys, you know, they got off a bus or something. I was saw, I saw Triple H in like skinny jogging pants. I saw that. Uh, that may have been he carrying a bag. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And walking into the building. Yeah, was he like a, like a like a hotel desk or something, or walking past that? No, it looked like an arena to me. Well, maybe it was an arena. I've seen the photo, but uh, uh, yeah. Well, that answers that then. Okay. Uh, we, yeah, we've got time for a couple more. Uh, Garrett Hernandez, Saint Bernardino, oh, San Bernardino, California. Howdy to you, Dutch, uh, Mister James. Love the show. I look forward to it every week. As you may have noticed, the Young Bucks always have the corpse referee, Rick Knox, for every single one of their matches. Do you remember anyone ever requesting a specific referee for their matches and why this would be one of their peccadillos? Thanks, keep up the amazing work. Peccadillos, a good word. Is a peccadillo like a proclivity? Something like that, I say. Like okay. minor quirk. Okay, who's who do the Young Bucks have? So apparently they've got a referee called Rick Knox who uh, referees all of their matches. Do you remember any talent who insisted on having one referee referee for them all the time? No, not really. The only one I know is Steve Austin and Earl Hebner generally refereed for him. But that's, that's because uh, Steve liked him. Yeah. They'd play cars together and they'd do this and do that. And, you know, and they got along... You know, they're both country boys, and so, and uh, you see Earl or who, <clears throat> who was it, what's his brother's name? Dave. Earl, Dave. Dave wasn't really he, refereeing, refereeing in the late 90s, though, for the most part. He did a tiny bit, but it was all, well, it was nearly always Earl. Well, he was, he was a level above that. I don't know. Yeah. Was they're he, both was good guys. Agent? Was Dave an agent as far as? Not really an agent, but he was. He may have been ref over the referees. I don't know. Tell you the truth. He never gave me a finish. And but uh and what was the question you say in that Oh oh uh, we've already answered it. About special special referee. I don't remember that. No. Okay, so that was a bust, so we'll probably we've still got time for two more then. Larry Burns, I just watched a video montage about Congo Kong in TNA. Did you know him? Were you there with him? I thought he was amazing for his size. Do you have any info on him? Thank you, and I love everything both of you all do. Congo Kong. Do you want me to get a photo of him up? Get a photo. Okay, one second. All right, let's have a look. Uh, la, 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 la. Congo Kong TNA. I remember the name. I don't remember. I remember him. So who's this fella now? I don't recognize him. I think he's, uh, I looked at before, 6'8". Yeah, he was a big guy, and he just had very little. I uh, I don't remember. I don't remember what we did with him. 
apparently nothing. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't, I remember the guy now, and he was uh, just a big guy, is all I know. And he painted his face up, and but looking at it now, it looked like a pretty decent gimmick. But when you put gimmicks like this together, you gotta you gotta put the whole package. Hmm. And he's, you know, you gotta make him a show within a show. So I think he comes out there. He needs some kind of ceremony or something and get in the ring. And and when he starts on the guy, he beats the living crap out of him. And then the manager's got to come in there and do something to him or give him something or put something in his mouth to calm him down. And I, I have never seen this guy before in my life. Well, there you go. I mean, he was a big enough guy and he had a decent look to him, I guess. But no, nope. and I don't know. I don't know. I don't. As far as I, I, I met him there, and I think I've talked to him a time or two, but I don't know him. I, I mean, at, as, as a talent. A, oops, I was going to say, look at him strangling a bis. Or uh, Joseph Parks there. <laughs> there we go. Okay, I'm going to ask you one more question, and then we will finish this up. Clay says, you worked with and held multiple tag titles with Austin Idol. In reference to Idol, I've always thought he had the potential to have had the spot Hulk Hogan landed in New York and been just as successful. What are your thoughts on this? Thanks again, guys, for all you do. Well, I think he was more showbiz than Hulk was. Because he had, uh, I think he had the flair. He wasn't as big as Hogan, and that's what got him the job. And all Hogan's got to do is is romp around and show his muscles and and do the the deal with the ear. That was Hogan put that in there. And but I, I think, but he was in he was in New York as what was his other name that he worked under? Oh, it wasn't his real name, was it? No, he worked under another name though. Let me have a look. Mike McCord. I think he worked under that name. Yeah, that's his real name. Yeah, I'm trying to look at his name. Uh, and Austin he may Idol, have Black he Diamond. may have worked Dennis McCord. Oh. Dennis McCord, maybe. But he worked in Mid Atlantic as as McCord. I'm pretty sure. And then I think he changed it when he went to Florida. And I don't know if he would have reached the the peak of Hulk. But I think he would have been over. But the first time they wanted to beat him, no, no, I don't think so. Not today. <laughs> that's that's the way he talks. Well, let me tell you something. <laughs> Are you saying he wasn't that amenable to losing? No, he didn't. He didn't like that at all. <laughs> and he, and it's funny. You get into business where you both got to lose to each other to make each other important. But I think uh, Idol, Austin Idol, thought that getting beat was like the end of the world. And no, he wasn't a big fan of that at all. And again, I can't, I can't hold him. I, I can't hold it against him because he probably knew something I didn't know or I didn't recognize at the time because – all of a sudden, they'll tell you one thing, and all of a sudden, after you do that, after you get beat and leave, they don't even book you the next week, but they got the tape. So for eternity, they the last time the people can see you, maybe, is you laying flat on your back for the three count. So, and he had he was the most doubtful guy about promoters. Again, I won't say he's wrong. But every promoter doesn't have to be that way. He's got to have some people that trust him anyway. But I don't think he trusted many of them. Here's a story. Did I tell you this about him in Columbus, Georgia, and about a royal? Yeah, yeah, we've we've uh, we've got. It's well, a great, it's a great story. That is but, uh, a great, great story. I've, 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 let me add this then. So, like, if if he was never going to go to the WWF because I suspect he didn't enjoy traveling that much, especially after the plane crash. So I don't. Th I think he was always destined to be like a regional hit, in that sense. He was never going to be a Hulk Hogan flying around the world. 
Yeah. Hmm. That, that could have that could have been one thing that held him back. But he was over in Memphis. Mm -hmm. He was over there uh, because he was he was brought in to angle with Lawler. And if Lawler, Lawler is, is good at one thing, that's getting his opponent over the first time around, and he'll beat Lawler. Lawler don't mind getting beat because he, he knows he's is going to come around at the end of that angle. Who's going over? Lawler. So they pay the guy pretty good and keep him happy and then go to the end of it, and then he's gone. <laughs> this question says uh, you held multiple tag team titles with Austin Idol. So when, when you win a title, you've got to lose a title. Did you take the pinfall for every single one of those title losses? Hell yeah. You couldn't beat <laughs> Idol. It was always me, you know. One time, I remember he said something, he said, yeah, I'd, huh? I don't know if you need to beat me. And then they ended up changing it. I forgot. I think I was in maybe Knoxville somewhere. But, and guess what? Old Dutch said, hey, whatever. It don't make a damn to me. And it didn't really. I think you're as good as what they want you to be. And when you step outside that box, then... You can create more of a scene than what is necessary and more of a problem. And I just wanted to dodge all that. So I just go ahead and I forgot where we were that he, he said that. Hey, he. <laughs> That's what he talked to. <laughs> he does. <laughs> don't work for me, daddy. What? It don't, yeah, don't work for me. Yeah, he'd say, Daddy, Daddy, Brother. Oh, he's too much. And you're going to be in the same room as him on May 10th and 11th in Evansville, I will. Indiana, yeah. doing a signing and with all the people. He, he'll hear this, and he'll say, What do you mean saying that how you dropped all the falls when the team with me? I said, Name one where I didn't. <laughs> then he went, Well... That's not the way this is supposed to. Go. <laughs> I just want to attack you for talking about me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, we we might get one more Dutch Mantel versus Austin Idol match impromptu May tenth and May eleventh at the big signing May, in Evansville. May. In uh, Evansville, Indiana. I'm going to be Lawler. at the same table with him. I'm just going to reach over and clothesline the hell out of him. And <laughs> him down. There you go. That's another reason why you Then when he there. gets up, guess what? I won't fight him. I just got shh, 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 right in his face. Oh, God. Pepper spray. Oh, hey, that would make news, wouldn't it? Oh, yeah. Dutch, Dutch, pepper sprays Austin Idol at signing. Mm. Hey, we need That's something footage. you don't expect. We need the huh? exclusive footage so we, we can post we, it. Yeah, we do. I'll have the I'll have the camera ready. There we go then. Well, uh, that's something for you to look forward to May 10th and 11th in Evansville. So I'll do the quick plugs. Once again, we got books, diplomas, Dirty Dutch Mantel at 2L, with 2Ls at gmail.com for signed stuff from Dutch. And the big one is questions for Dutch at gmail.com to have your questions submitted for future consideration for a future episode of Ask Dutch Anything. But for now, thank you very much for watching. And Dutch, we the people. Hey, did you use your right hand you use your left hand? Right. You did? Right hand. What, what hand does that look like? Right? That's your right, yeah. Okay. We I the people. I thought you had your camera backwards. We the people. We, we the people. <laughs>